on episode 582 of the 40 plus fitness podcast we meet michael taylor and discuss his book i'm not okay with gray how to create an extraordinary life after 50. you can find the full show notes for this episode at 40 plus fitness podcast.com forward slash 582. have you decided you're ready to make a change to reclaim your health and fitness. The 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. Each week, we dive deep into health and fitness topics that affect those of us over 40. I'm Coach Allen. I'm an NASM certified personal trainer with specializations in corrective exercise, behavior change, performance enhancement, and fitness nutrition. A Precision Nutrition Level 1 coach, a FAI certified functional aging specialist, and an OTA Level 2 online trainer. Each week, I'm joined by our co-host, Coach Rachel. She is an NASM certified personal trainer and a RRCA level one run coach. Let us be your coaches as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Are you tired of feeling stuck in your weight loss journey? Do you find it difficult to know if you're training effectively? Are you frustrated with the slow pace of progress? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then it's time to take action with 40 Plus Fitness Online Personal Training. You'll have personalized nutrition and training plans designed to address your unique needs and help you achieve your fitness and weight loss goals. 40 Plus Fitness Online Personal Training offers the ultimate convenience, allowing you to train when and where you want to, and basically have a coach in your pocket for guidance, support, and accountability. No more wasting time on ineffective workouts or diets that don't work. Take the first step toward a healthier, happier you by scheduling a free discovery call with me at 40plusfitness.com forward slash discovery. On this call, we'll discuss your unique needs and how you can get the results you want and deserve. And best of all, you'll leave this discovery call with a plan of action. So what are you waiting for? Book your free discovery call with me today by going to 40plusfitness.com forward slash discovery. Results start with this click, 40plusfitness.com forward slash discovery. Hey, Rachel, how are you? Hey. hey, Alan, good. How are you today? I'm doing all right. Uh, good. Kind of busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> busy is you know, good. We're, well, yeah, because well, we're we're rounding out the the final bits of busy season here uh, in Bocas. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, a lot of movement, still a lot of moving parts and this and that. And just getting things go, you know, just keeping things going and saying, okay, nice. well, now I've got to spin this plate and then I got to run over here and <laughs> spin oh, that plate. Geez. <laughs> and, you know, just, so just being pulled in a few different directions, but it, it's good. It's good. We've had a really good, good season at Lula's. And so I'm, I'm just really excited that, uh, that that's going well. Good. And, um, you know, so just keep, keep the plate spinning. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, good. Glad everything's going well at Lula's. How are things up there? Good. We are also kind of busy with the maple syrup boil still happening, <laughs> still collecting. I got to do my rounds later this afternoon. <laughs> that is the funniest thing is that, okay, mm -hmm. you're keto and you're talking mm -hmm. about maple syrup. It's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny. We, we tell everybody, you know, we have a lot and we actually, this is, let's see, this year we'll have had about four boils. So we should end up probably close to about maybe four gallons, maybe not quite four full gallons of maple syrup. And you're right. We don't, we don't eat it. We share it. We give it to everybody, but it's um, the time outdoors is really special. And this type of little homesteading habit that we have of turning maple sap into syrup is such a really neat lost kind of um, art form, you know? So it's, uh, it's, we like to share it with our friends. And so we like to have the kids come and see what it's all about. And it's just a really fun thing to, to do and to share. It's a, it's just fun. Well, cool. Cool. Yeah. All right. Are you ready to talk to, uh, Michael Taylor? Sure. Our guest today is an entrepreneur, author of nine books, motivational speaker, and radio show host who has dedicated his life to empowering men and women to reach their full potential. 
He knows firsthand how to overcome adversity and build rewarding and fulfilling life. And he is sharing his knowledge and wisdom with others to support them in creating the life of their dreams. He is no stranger to adversity and challenges. He was born in the inner city of the projects in Corpus Christi, Texas, to a single mother of six children. Although he dropped out of high school in the 11th grade, his commitment to living an extraordinary life supported him in defying the odds. Through his books, lectures, and radio program, he now coaches others on how to become genuinely happy with their lives and live the lives that they were born to live. With no further ado, here's Michael Taylor. Michael, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Hello, Alan. Thanks for having me, man. Really excited about the conversation. Well, I, I haven't I haven't shaved in a few days, and it's starting to itch, so I'm going to be shaving pretty quick here. Uh, because another thing that happens when when I don't shave, being 57 years old, uh, somehow or another, you don't seem to have this problem. But uh, I have a lot of grays that come out. And your book is called I'm Not Okay with Gray, How to Create an Extraordinary Life After 50. Well, being 57, as I said, just kind of that title just kind of kicks you and says, okay, <laughs> that's <laughs> that's what I want. Uh, other than I, I'm okay with the gray, um, just sometimes not okay with where that where that takes us mentally gotcha you know interestingly enough the, the way the title came about is i'm actually would be fully gray but i i dye my hair right and so a friend of, I, of mine and i were having a conversation about dyeing my beard my, my goatee <clears throat> and he said man why you dye your beard why don't you just go gray and i said well i'm not okay with gray and as soon as I made the comment, I went, wow, that is a cool title yes. for a book. And so as an <laughs> author, what I usually do whenever I have a cool title that pops up like that, I make a little note on my phone, right? I said, you know, I'm going to write a book called I'm Not Okay with Gray. <laughs> and fast forward a year and a half or so, and here I am promoting the book. And it's a great book. You know, if if you're, if you're someone that's kind of at that point where you're struggling with a lot of where you are in your world, um, there's a lot in this book to to look at. And um, I think one of the reasons that this is kind of, this is really an important topic is we we get to or around the age of 50. Some of it's a little earlier, some is a little bit later. Um, but we start asking ourselves those, those deeper questions, you know, is it all worth it? Where am I going? You know, and, and sometimes it's because our, our kids are no longer kids anymore and they're off running and doing their lives. Sometimes we've gone through some pretty drastic changes uh, that midlife will often either spur in us to to do, or they just almost seem to happen because we're, we're actually looking ahead instead of feeling stuck and looking backwards um, for the good or the bad. Um, but one of the words, the word you used in, in this book, uh, as you kind of went through the subsections and as, as I was, when I first saw that, you know, the table contents, cause I, I actually read all the books and I'm going through the table contents and I'm like, okay, he's using this word, he's using this word. And then when I started actually reading what you had written, I'm like, you could not have used a better word because you think about the title. I'm not okay with gray. And I was like, Okay, well, what are you going to do about it? Well, you can dye your hair. Okay, great. That doesn't change anything fundamentally in your life. But you use the word embrace. And I think that is such a powerful word as I was kind of sitting there. You know, I got chills now thinking about how important that word is as we look to change our lives and just what the word embrace means. So I wanted to dive into your head a little bit about that word because you 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 obviously chose it you're an author and a speaker you chose that word on purpose this isn't an accident um let's talk about that word from your perspective well first of all the title has absolutely nothing to do with hair color <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the title really is about i'm committed to empowering men and women over 50 right to change their mindsets about aging so they can make the rest of their lives the best of their lives, okay? So the title, again, is kind of a catchy title, but in reality, it's really about changing our mindsets. And I, as a former atheist, there was a time in my life where I had absolutely no, I was completely close to the idea that there was something bigger than me out there, right? Well, I went on this amazing journey, found my own spiritual connection, 
But what embrace is for me, it's about incorporating, bringing into your awareness new ideas. And so when I say embrace, you know, there's so many talking heads and experts out there that are telling you, you should do this, you should do that. And, and so I'm not trying to tell you to do anything. I'm making a suggestion for you to embrace this idea, this different way of looking at things. So that if you're willing to do that, I believe you can change your life. But we have to be willing to embrace these new ideas, which can be difficult for some. But I don't think anything changes until we embrace new ways of thinking, believing, and behaving. And so that's why I focused on that word. Yeah. And and like I said, I think it's just a really a powerful word because you're not telling people a path. And this, this, this is the path to the extraordinary life. This is what you have to do. Just, just, just do these 10 things and, and your life will be better. What you're saying is the world is the world. Sometimes it's changing in ways that we don't necessarily agree with or want. Um, we have to control what we can control. And we have to put into our lives what we want to have in our lives. And we've got to not have things in our lives that we want out of our lives. And so the idea of embracing things and looking for the good in them, I think is really a powerful way of approaching this because there are going to, th- you know, my, you know, my elbow hurts, my knee hurts, well, my hip hurts. And we could, we could embrace that and we can talk about that all day, or we can, we can really kind of get into deeper conversations about who we are and why we're here and what we're trying to accomplish with like you said, the second half of our lives, Uh, because if you're over 50 and you're listening to this, there's a high probability you might just live another hundred, I mean, another 50 years with medical science the way it is. And wouldn't it be a shame to not live that second half even close to the first half when all of your horror stories, you know, we sit down and talk about all the hardships and the things you had in your life. And I think, you know, I had these things and they're in my life. And, you know, I can say, would I, you know, the whole question, would you, would you go back and relive your life again? Um, you know, and how would you change it? And it's like, I don't even want to think about that. You know, <laughs> I just don't <laughs> even want to go there. I don't, I don't even want that. It's like, if you told me I could keep living my life the way I am, or I could go back and live it again, I'd probably just live it where I'm at. I'd be what I am. Um, but I like but Alan, here, here, Yeah, but here, here's the thing that I, I think a lot of people are missing. We live in a society and culture that loves bad news. <laughs> I mean, it's just <laughs> <Really>? amazing. <laughs> <laughs> we, we focus so much attention on what's wrong with the world. But see, my belief is that there are a lot more things that are right with the world than are wrong with it. And one of the things that's really right with the world is as a human being, we are moving into, a lot of people don't realize that they're predicting in the next 20 years or so, the average lifespan is gonna be 120 years old. People are gonna be living longer because of technology, because of, you know, they're doing, you know, uh, DNA sequencing and all of these cool things they're doing with technology. So the question becomes, if we're going to be living that long, how are we going to live the second half of our lives? And so my personal belief, I'm 62, I'll be 63 this year. But honestly, man, I, I, I really feel like I'm still in my 30s. And when I say feel like that, it's not just physically, it's just emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, I just feel alive. And I know that that's what a lot of people are hungry for, that feeling of aliveness. And you'll never get that feeling of aliveness from how much money you have in the bank, how big your house is, how big, what kind of car you drive. It's an internal process of connecting with our authentic selves. And so again, I have set an intention. I plan on living to be 100 years old at least. I just want to get the three digits, <laughs> if nothing else. I want. I just for my own, just from my own goal setting, whatever. I want to say, I'm 100. That's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. But the problem is, there'll be dozens and dozens of us standing right next to you because we're we're a lot of us are going to get there. But when we get there, I think this is what scares a lot of people is that we might not have taken care of the vehicle that's going to get us there. (laughs) There you go. There you go. And that's, see, and that's the thing. It is my belief 
that there is nothing on this planet that is more amazing than the human body. The human body, in my opinion, is the is the ultimate, I call it the ultimate vehicle, right? And we sometimes forget that it is the only vehicle on the planet that actually gets stronger the more we use it. And so if we don't use it, it begins to atrophy. And so the people that are afraid of getting older, a lot of times it's because we're afraid of being incapacitated. We're afraid of, you know, being, you know, limped over with a cane or a crutch or whatever. So I'm saying, why not change our mindsets to say, you know what, I do want to live to be 100. And so what do I need to do to try to make sure that when I get there, I'm not incapacitated? Well, you have a perfect show. We got to take care of our health. We've got to take care of this. We've got to take care of this amazing physical body that we have. And so it's important for us to understand the idea that the body is perfect by design, right? And we just have to be willing to do a few things to help it stay and run at its optimal level. So in, in the book, you shared 10 simple steps to take care of your physical body. Could you talk about a few of those, some of your favorite ones, maybe? Well, but let me let me show you tell you how I got on this health journey, though. This is a really cool story. Okay. When I was 18 years old, I got my first full-time job. I've always had a great work ethic and so forth. So I got this, this full-time job. Well, at 18, I still wasn't willing to give up my partying lifestyle. <laughs> so <laughs> I'd go out, I'd stay out at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, get up and be to work by 8. Well, sometimes I'd even spend a night in my car in the parking lot of my job because I'd stayed out partying all night. Well, one morning I wake up, I take a shower, and as I'm showering, I feel this little twinge in my chest. Disregarded, didn't pay attention to it. I get to work, and I was working at a building supply center, and I'm loading these two by fours into this rack. And all of a sudden, it felt like, you remember you remember the Rambo knife? You remember, you remember <laughs> Rambo, the big knife that he had? Well, yeah. it felt like the Rambo knife went through my heart. And it was so debilitating that I literally just blacked out. When I woke up, I'm, I'm getting rolled to an ambulance. Again, I'm only 19 years old. 18 years old, and, I, and they roll me to the ambulance. I wake up, I look around, don't know what's going on. So we get in the ambulance. The guys hooked me up with EKGs or whatever, and the, and the guy says, you can slow down. There's nothing wrong with his heart. I'm like, what? So I get to the hospital. There's the doctor. And once again, they've got me hooked up with all the EKGs and everything. And the doctor walks in, and he says, well, tell me what's wrong. I say, hey, man, you're the doctor. You tell me what's wrong. Did I just have a heart attack? He said, no, you didn't have a heart attack. He started asking me questions. And he gets to the point about, well, can you think of anything that you've done differently recently? And I said, well, I hadn't been sleeping a lot lately. And he goes, oh, tell me more about that. So I started explaining to him how I was doing what I was doing. And basically what happened was my body was so tired, it literally shut down. And what happened is the muscles in my chest cramped around my heart so intensely that it gave the, the symptoms of a heart attack because it basically cramped around my heart and boom, it just shut everything down temporarily. And that's when I blacked out. Well, he gave me some muscle relaxers and I slept for like 21 hours straight. But the amazing thing about that is that after that incident, I had a really interesting conversation with myself. And that conversation was, wow, my body is smarter than I am. I wouldn't slow down. So it took the necessary steps to make me slow down. And that was in 1978. And after that, I saw the movie Rocky. I wanted to be like Apollo Creed. So I got me a little set of uh, cement weights and started working out. And I've been working out ever since. So. In answer to your question, the things that we have to do, I think from a physical standpoint, I would point to exercise. But for me, the most important thing that I've done in regards to my health 
is something I started 30 years ago, which was meditation. Learning to meditate was the most life-changing experience that I've ever had because I've always been an overthinker. And man, I used to get these thinking headaches. I couldn't turn my mind off. And so I took some classes and I learned how to meditate. And it has been just amazing. Again, I've been doing it for 30 years. Um, after that, I think an important part that we don't talk about, especially as men, when we talk about our health, is our emotional health. I didn't recognize that I had a lot of stuff. I had a lot of emotional baggage that um, I had to be willing to unpack. And one way that I unpacked it was I gained the courage to go to therapy. And I unpacked a lot of that emotional baggage that I've been carrying around for a long, long time. And then that's when these, the, the third part is just making sure I take care of my body, uh, getting annual physicals making sure that I'm paying attention to how my body feels. Um, I'm not a health nut by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm extremely healthy. Uh, again, at 62, I can still bench press over 350. I go to the gym three days a week. So obviously exercise is a really important part of that. So those would be the three things that I would point to, first of all, when I start talking about health, because you mentioned health in terms of wellness, but also happiness. And I couldn't have gotten to that place of happiness if I, number one, hadn't learned to meditate. Number two, hadn't dealt with some emotional baggage that was keeping me held down. Yeah. And I think that's kind of the the crux of all this, because because I I the way I phrase it is, is I, I want to be able to wipe my own butt when I'm 105. And so <laughs> kind of buried buried in that is, yes, I do want to live past 100, but then I don't want my body to not be there for me. I want to be independent. I want to be able to take care of myself. I want to be able to do the basic things that I need to be able to do to be a functioning 105 year old. Um, I'm obviously not going to be doing tough mutters and all that kind of crazy stuff then. Uh, but I want to make sure that I'm doing as much as I can to enjoy the life that I have. Um, and that's going to require physical fitness, health, and all these other things. And I guess one of the things that drove me there, and, and I want to talk about this, this is a whole chapter in your book, so we could probably talk for hours on this. Uh, you probably, I think you have some of your other books might even just be about this, but one of the topics in your book, and one I think that's really overlooked in the way that most of us approach our lives, and a lot of times, yes, even when we're in our 50s, is we, we, don't, en we don't embrace joy, passion, and purpose. And... Mm -hmm. I think as a result, just to me, as I start thinking about it, it's like, well, what else is there? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, the, but, you know, at the same time, I back up and I say, well, okay, that's, I, I, I didn't, I, I never thought about things this way before I kind of had my, my moment of what I'd say, okay, I woke up and I figured out that I was not going in the direction I needed to be going and I had to fix something. And, and that's again, part of why I define things the way I do is because I understand I could, I could be completely healthy and pass the test. You know, you do the blood test. I'm like, Oh, your, your model of health. I was in college. I had a similar story to you. Um, I was leg pressing and I had these like crazy swimmers going on in my eyes. I almost passed out doing leg press, uh, not advisable. And I went to the doctor and he's like, Oh, you're, you're like a, you know, you're healthy as a horse was the words he said, you know, you're as healthy as they come. And I'm like, no, my body's telling me something. <laughs> my body's telling me <laughs> that, that. And what it was, is kind of the same thing. I was going to college. I was working, I was lifting. I was, I was just doing too much and didn't realize and wasn't listening to my body. I wasn't listening to myself. And I think, you know, when you talk about embracing joy, passion, and purpose, um, that's what I've come to understand is, is why I'm here, why we're here. Can you talk a little bit about that? And, and how, how does one go about embracing joy, passion, and purpose? Well, let me back up just a little bit. So when I was 23, I was living the American dream. I had the house, the wife, the 2.5 kids and all of that. And by society standards, I was successful. Within about a six and a half year time frame, that dream turned into a nightmare. I went through a divorce, bankruptcy, foreclosure, 
a deep state of depression. I was actually homeless for two years living out of my car. And during the darkest period of my life, I received a miracle. I was sitting up late one night because I was too depressed to sleep. And I was sitting at the edge of my bed, looking across the room at my bookshelf, when I happened to notice that every book on my bookshelf had something to do with getting rich or making money. And as I looked at those books, this question just popped in my head. Michael, what if you took all the energy and effort you've used in trying to get rich and simply figure out how to be happy? Now, as simplistic as that question may <laughs> sound, it literally changed and saved my life in an instant. Something in me shifted, and all of a sudden, my depression lifted, and I had this amazing clarity that I was going to be able to rebuild my life, and it was going to become extraordinary. And what I realized after that conversation was all my life I had been chasing money and stuff. And so I had gained all the money and the stuff that I thought would make me happy, but I was miserable. So then what happened was I stopped reading books on getting rich and making money. I started reading books on psychology and, and, and philosophy and spirituality and metaphysics. So I went on this amazing, what I'll call my journey of transformation. And it was through that journey that I gained the courage to go to therapy and began unpacking some of the baggage that I talked about. And so for most of us, or shall I say a lot of us, especially as men, we have been conditioned to believe that we really have three primary responsibilities, what I call the three Ps, procreate, provide, and protect. What society didn't teach us as men is how to connect. And in order to connect, we have to be in touch with our emotions, who we are as human beings, and the feeling, the feeling, that's the critical piece. Because, you know, for a lot of men, the feeling is the F word. We don't want to talk about feelings because feelings are for women. But what I've come to understand is in unpacking all of my emotional baggage, I have to be willing to get in touch with and tap into my feelings and what that meant. And so, when you start talking about joy, passion, and purpose, if we aren't willing to unpack our emotional baggage, it's difficult, if not impossible, for us to fully feel and experience authentic joy. Because we've got it covered up with all this other stuff. We've got it covered up with competition. We've got it you know, comp uh, tied into trying to look good. You know, we wear these masks as men. We hide behind these walls of, of um, invulnerability. You know, we, we as men, we, we've got all these defense mechanisms against joy because we're trying to do the things society says we're supposed to do as men with the stuff. And so I had to be willing to unpack all of that. And in doing so, what I discovered, first of all, was this intense, deeply deep, deep feeling of joy that everyone has access to if we're willing to go deeply enough. But again, it's a journey that few people are willing to take. <laughs> but when we do, we get to a point where we realize we don't have to have anything outside of ourselves to be happy. We don't have to have the wife. We don't have to have the sex. We don't have to have, we just have to have who we are, and there's joy in that. And so this has been a 30-year process, a 30-year journey that I'm still on. But what I can say, Alan, as I speak to you today, I am happier now than I've ever been in my life. My life is filled with joy. My passion, which is writing and speaking, I get to do that as a living, which is amazing. And last but not least, I'm fulfilling my divine purpose, because I think every human being has a unique purpose, and it is our responsibility to figure out what that is. And the only way we'll ever do that is be is to be willing to do our inner work, take that inner journey to wake up to and discover who we really are. Yeah, I um, I was I was the the corporate guy. I was the guy who worked his way up, you know, vice president before I was thirty nine. This kind of thing. And I was miserable. 
<laughs> just completely yeah. miserable. I had all this stuff. I had all this stuff and I had all the money and I felt great. I mean, you know, you say, okay, I, I made more money. I got a raise. I, my bonus comes, you know, all this stuff is great, but I was just miserable because I wasn't being authentic to myself. I wasn't being who I needed to be. And I could be great at a job, but that's all that defined me at that point in my life. And, and it wasn't, there was no passion to it anymore. There's no anything. I, you know, it's just a point where I was like, okay, and this is who I am and this is what I do. And I can be really good at it and I can feel good when people acknowledge that I'm good at it, but it just really didn't bring me together until I realized that, that knowing just one thing that helped me and being willing to share that one thing with someone else in an authentic, open way where I can say I was flawed. I was broken. I was miserable. And, and while my path won't necessarily be your path, this is, this is where I went. And what I'm doing now is I, every time I'm faced with a, a pivot, if you will, something has to change. I got laid off from a corporate job and I went home and I, I told my wife, you know, I'm getting laid off from this job. Um, I'm not going back. I don't like those people. I don't like who they make me. I don't like what they make me do. Uh, I don't like laying people off. I don't like the job that I had. Like what I like is helping someone else change their health and fitness. What I like is reading a, a book like yours and having this conversation, knowing that someone else is going to hear your message and it's going to help them. And, mm -hmm. and so I think too often we're like, well, yeah, but I've, but I've got the kids. Yeah. But I've, and I'm like, fine, figure that out. But in the end, until you're really focused on who would be the best you, you could be right now. And what can you do? You talked about reading books on happiness and, and joy and psychology and those types of things. You didn't immediately go to, Oh, wow. I'm, my depression's over and I'm there. It was a journey. Right. It was a journey. Oh, yeah. It was a journey that you took. And I really appreciate that you shared that in this book, because it's just kind of one of those things to say, no, this is not, you're not an, Happiness is not an overnight success thing. Joy is not an overnight success thing. It's built. It's built through experience and it's built through authenticity. And it's built from, as you, as you acknowledge in your book, diving deep and, and actually turning out some of the muck that you buried back there that we're not supposed to talk about. You know, we're supposed to just suck it up and keep moving forward because we're men and that's what we do. Uh, you know, my new thing, I'm, I'm, I'm good at carrying things cause that's around the bed and breakfast. That's sort of my thing. I carry luggage upstairs and downstairs. I carry water, water bottles upstairs and downstairs. Um, cause I'm the best equipped to do that, <laughs> but that's not my passion. Yes. We need water upstairs. I don't mind taking water upstairs, but it's just knowing that, okay, within the realms of what I have control over, these are the best decisions for me and the people that I love. And you had a Venn diagram. Uh, so if anyone's struggling with this, you actually have the diagram in the book where you can go through and say, okay, what, am, what do I enjoy? What are people going to value? What are they going to pay me for? And, and you know, what, 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 what am I basically, uh, what I, what, what would I enjoy? What am I good at? What would other people pay me for and what would benefit the world? And when you find that intersection, which is not something you just find today, but when you find that intersection and you're working in that space, um, it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Because your, your purpose will be found at the intersection of that, which you love to do and that, which other people need. So when you take what you love to do, for example, you love inspiring people with your message and doing the radio show, right. And people need to hear what's possible. People need to hear examples of the challenges and the things that we go through so that they can know that, okay, if I'm going through some stuff, he got through it, so maybe I can get through it. So you, in essence, what you're doing is you're being in service to humanity. And it is in being in service to humanity that we have a feeling of fulfillment. You can't get that feeling of fulfillment because you get a fat check. 
right? Okay. Not, <laughs> nothing, nothing wrong with it. Not, There's nothing, nothing wrong, wrong with a big with, fat check. But <laughs> Nothing wrong with getting a big fat check. And it feels great to have money in your checking account. So please don't hear me say that money's bad in any way. But I can assure you, after having all the money and losing it all, and now regaining it, thank God. But, but the feeling of knowing that I've impacted somebody's life in the positive way. For example, somebody sends me an email saying how, how I literally changed their life with my book. You can't put a price on that. <laughs> you yeah. can't, you can't, I mean, that the, the feeling of connectedness. And so I think for men, because actually 80% of my books are targeted specifically to men. Because I believe the greatest challenge we have in our society today is to redefine manhood and masculinity. And for men, that's the really difficult thing to do, thing to do because we're trapped in this antiquated paradigm of masculinity that men are really holding on to, even though it's no longer sustainable. But now men are starting to wake up and they're going, you know what? Maybe there's a different way. And so they listen to a show like this, or they read one of my books, or they, they do something that goes, oh, damn, I've been doing the man thing all wrong. Because here's the key, I think. And this is, this, this is the key that most men will balk at. Vulnerability is a superpower. <laughs> when we can be honest and authentic and vulnerable with ourselves and with others, it's a superpower. It's what allows us to connect. See, because you can't be relational if you're unwilling to be emotional. And emotions, the expression of emotions is a vulnerable place, which men really struggle with. But I can assure you, when we get comfortable there, there's magic that happens. It, I, 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 I wish I could put it into words for men who are going, oh, there he goes. Talking about those feelings again, you know, it's like, no, but it, there, there's a magic that happens when you connect with who you really are, and then you create a space to allow others to do the same. Because our hearts connect, and there's a part of us that connects to each other, and then it's, it's a beautiful thing to see men get past all the, the toughness, the alpha male, you know, kind of macho uh, attitudes and go, you know what? Maybe I'm a little scared right now, or, you know, maybe I'm a little sad right now, and I just need to share, you know, and there's so much healing in that process. But again, men are really struggling with it. But the good yeah. news is, and, and again, I started writing back in 95. And back in 95, there were very few men talking about this new paradigm of masculinity that I'm talking about. But now there's unlimited coaches and, and programs and men are waking up, I believe. So just being on your show gives me another reason for optimism that you're even having this conversation with me today. And again, it just fills me with hope. Yeah. Well, you, you can't fix what you're not willing to admit is broken. Yeah. You know, you can sit there and say, Absolutely. yeah, you know, someone gets in your car and hey, dude, what's, what's that ping? I keep, I keep hearing a ping. It's, no, you don't hear nothing. You don't hear nothing. Everything's fine. Car's fine. Well, you're never going to fix that car because you're not willing to admit there's just something wrong. And there, in your internal dialogue, you're telling yourself about that ping every day, but you're just trying to ignore it. And until you open up and go to that voice and say, okay, let's talk about this ping. What's going on here? And sometimes you need help with that. And sometimes you can do that conversation on your, on your own, but you get into your head and you're like, why? Am I the way I am? Why are things the way they are? You know, I, I, and, and most of us, I think we'll point to something where we did really well. You know, I was looking at, uh, when I had my problems, I'm like, why am, why do I suck so much at this? You know, I'm so good at everything else or all these other things, you know, why, why is this thing, you know, cause it was my health. It was my fitness. It was my relationships. I'm like, why, why is it that I, I can be the best at this corporate job? Uh, you know, of anything. I'm like, I literally just, it's, it's almost like it just happens for me. I don't, now I don't even have to, I don't even feel like I'm working at it. It just happens. And why is it, why am I so good at that? Why have I been able to do the hard, hard, hard things that other people can't do 
or they know this very, very hard. And I was able to do those. And then it, it came down to a basic word in my head and it was commitment. And it was mm-hmm. me waking myself up and saying, Alan, you just haven't committed yourself to change. And until you do, you're going to keep being this. And until I told myself, well, no, this isn't good enough for me. I deserve better. And then, you know, again, I, I think I was fortunate. It took me, it took me eight years uh, to have that conversation. Uh, but I think I was fortunate in that I recognized that being flawed was not what was holding me back. The flaw was the ping in the car. Mm. And that could be fixed. But I had to be willing to accept the ping to get fixed, if that makes sense to you. Sure. And, you know, here's the thing. And we'll we'll use the um, metaphor that the body, the human body is like a vehicle. Because if we're driving a vehicle and the check engine light comes on, <laughs> you know, it's letting us know. My wife, if my wife, if my wife, one time my wife is like, just, well, yeah, it'll go off. Just keep driving. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> and, and that's and that's what we do right we just ignore <laughs> it right yeah well see the human body is always sending us signals that something needs to be looked at for example high blood pressure is a signal you know um high um what am i thinking of uh cholesterol high cholesterol these are all signals that the body's saying something's wrong so you need to take care of it And so the key is, number one, identify that something's wrong. Make a commitment that you're going to at least investigate what might be wrong. And this is where men fall short. I've heard so many men say, for example, prostate cancer. Um, Prostate cancer, unfortunately, is, is very prevalent with Black males, right? And so I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who happened to be black about, you know, having a prostate exam. Man, I ain't going to have no prostate exam. No. <laughs> Why not? Well, no, no, no. What he didn't want to say is he was homophobic and he didn't want a guy sticking his finger up his butt. And I'm, I'm making fun of it. But the truth is, imagine how many lives could be saved if we could get men to understand that this simple procedure can save your life? That simple procedure could say, I mean, literally thousands of men die because they're afraid or embarrassed to get that simple test. And so again, that's 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 why we have to change that conversation as men. We've, we've got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And one way to do that is by having conversations like this. I agree. Michael, I define wellness as being the healthiest, fittest, and happiest you can be. What are three strategies or tactics to get and stay well? I'm a huge proponent of unpacking your emotional baggage. That's the piece that men deny. If we're willing to unpack our emotional baggage, I can assure you, a lot of the other issues that we're dealing with will kind of take care of themselves. For example, a lot of people overeat because of something emotional. So if you unpack that emotional baggage first, then it sets you up to live a a happier, healthier life. Second thing, huge proponent of meditation. Meditation to me, it's it's high priority. And so um, a lot of people have this misconception about meditation as though it's you're trying to you're attempting to make your mind go blank. That's not meditation. Meditation is simply a practice and mindfulness is the result of that practice. So when I learn to meditate, I simply learn how to be aware and mindful what I'm thinking, how I'm feeling, what I believe. So meditation to me is is, is high priority. And last but not least is exercise. <laughs> I, I, I just, I, you've got, you've got, the body is designed to move. So you got to, you got to do something, even if it's just walking, Desi- it's designed to move. So make sure that you're utilizing this amazing thing called the human body by exercising it. Make sure you're eating right, taking care of it physically, and you're on your way. Great. Michael. If someone wanted to learn more about you and your book and your other books, uh, where would you like for me to send them? 
just send them to coachmichaeltaylor.com. Nice and simple. And that's Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, coachmichaeltaylor.com. Okay. You can go to 40plusfitness.com, 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 582, and I'll be sure to have a link there. Michael, thank you so much for being a part of 40 Plus Fitness. Well, thank you so much for what you're doing, because again, it takes collaboration. It takes us coming together, especially as men, sharing this information to help men live healthier lives. Welcome back, Raz. Hey, Alan. I love his title. I'm not okay with gray. <laughs> I do love that because I'm not okay with my gray hair quite yet, but <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. The interesting thing is he's he he's he, I think he may have said it on the podcast or we may have said it when we were talking offline. I'm not sure because he mm -hmm. and I kept having a conversation afterwards. I, I do All that right. every once in a while, but he mm -hmm. um he really didn't mean gray from the hair perspective so much right. as what you know just as people look at aging, yes. and I and I think you can say okay, well, you know I don't know when I when I was in my teens and someone was over thirty, man, they were way mm -hmm. old, and the people that yes. were over fifty. <laughs> Oh my oh gosh. God, they might just <laughs> die any minute, mm -hmm. you know? And, yep. and so it was just kind of my, my great grandmother. I remember she was, she was in her eighties and I just, I was like, holy crap, you know, she's older, <laughs> older than dirt. Right. I think this, the phrase they used back then was she's older mm -hmm. than dirt. Um, yeah. and you know, it's cool because, you know, it, you have these stories, but I think things are just very, very different now in that mm -hmm. we're, we're, we are aware that there's this aging curve and mm -hmm. we're aware that we can actually do something about it. Right. And so this generation, uh, the baby boomers, and then coming into X generation, um, we looked, we started looking at this very, very differently. Uh, mm -hmm. The baby boomers started living longer because of modern medicine and everything mm -hmm. else. And the X generation, we're kind of coming in and saying, well, <laughs> I don't want to just, live to a certain age. I want to, I want to, I want to thrive. Right. You know, I, I still want to have great relationships. I still want to enjoy myself. I still want to go out there and do sometimes kind of crazy things. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the living experience. And so I think that's what, you know, that's what he really meant by the title was he didn't want to just fade out. Right. And disappear. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people seem to seem to do and have done and, and they probably still will do, but it's yeah. just some people just, you know, they don't live, they don't live the last 20, 30 years of their life. They just exist. Right. And that wasn't good enough for him. <laughs> um, you know, so he wanted mm -hmm. more out of life. Um, he wants a great career. He wants a, a great relationship with his wife and he, he wants a great relationship with his friends. And mm -hmm. so it's just a, it's just a conversation point of saying, what are you doing today to not just fade out? Right. Well, it's an interesting concept too, that, you know, when we're young, we think we have all the time in the world to, um, you know, to take all these elaborate vacations and do all these things. But, um, you know, uh, by the time we get to our retirement age, you know, what kind of shape are we going to be in to do all these things? You know, so it's, it's an interesting concept on, on aging in that, you know, when I, just like you said, when I was young, I thought my grandparents were super old, but you know, now that I'm hitting 50, I I'll be 52 this year. I'm like, Hey, I got all this energy. I've got all this ability to go hiking and, and take all these fun vacations and see all these things. I want to be active and busy. I just don't want to sit around and watching TV all day. So you know, it's just but, a different attitude. But that's attitude. what they did. Yeah, that's what <laughs> they did. That you know, they you're, you're not going to miss an episode of Jeopardy. Um, <laughs> to say that. And 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 reality is, Jeopardy would probably still be on. Oh uh, gosh, yeah. When we're in our seventies and eighties, sure. Um, it'll be a different host. <laughs> it'll be a different mm -hmm. host. But you know, it's just it's just kind of one of those conversations of okay, take a deep take a deep deep look at yourself. Okay, mm -hmm. and for men, sometimes this is just really hard. Mm -hmm. is to just say, okay, am I, am I, am I doing the things that I, as a man need to do mm -hmm. to not just provide, but to have the right relationships and to be taking care of myself and, and recognize that, you know, I'm not, uh, invincible, right. I can be broken. You know, sure. and, and I'll say I'm, I'm a pretty darn durable person. Um, mm -hmm. I can get bumped around and, and 
been beat up, but I handle it. it, well, it, it, uh, you know, it, it's just kind of odd. You know, I remember, um, my grandparents when they were my age, like when they were my age, the conversations that, that older people would have is, well, how's your bursitis and how's this, and <laughs> how's your, how's your varicone yeah. veins, which, you know, yes. stay tuned to next week. We'll be talking about that. Yeah. What was that last week? That was last know, week. We talked about yeah. a couple weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, the, those are the conversations. What's your medical right. ailment of the week? Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't really have a lot of those, you know? No. Um, I don't, um, I don't wake up sore. I don't wake up hurt. I don't have a joint that's, you know, yeah, I've torn a rotator cuff, but I tore that like I was, like I would have if I was in college. It just mm-hmm. popped, you know, it's done. Right. And I was happened to be military pressing um, fairly heavy dumbbells at the time. Uh, not smart, but <laughs> it was what it was. But I think that's kind of the point is, you can turn your brain off to that stuff and think you're invincible, mm-hmm. but you're not. Right. And it's hard for a guy. Cause like I said, I don't have a lot of those ailments. I don't have a lot of those problems. Um, mm-hmm. I don't have to worry about my A1C. I don't have to worry about a lot of different things. So I don't take any medications at all mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm generally healthy. And sure. so the thing is, I know at some point I'm going to need help. I'm going to need, you know, something's going to happen. I'm mm-hmm. going to get sick at some level. I'm going to get old at some level. Um, mm-hmm. And I am going to have to ask for help. Someday. Um, yeah. And, and so it's just the question of, of having the relationships and having the self-awareness and the self-dignity to know when that is and to not mm-hmm. be stubborn about it and say, okay, I guess <laughs> I just, I guess I'm just not eating pickles anymore because I can't open a pickle jar by myself. Um, mm-hmm. No, I'm going to find someone to help me open that pickle jar. Um, because I like pickles. Um, and I'm not going to be ashamed of it <laughs> mm-hmm. at, at any stretch. If I can't open the pickle jar, I can't open the pickle jar. And, and so it's just that acceptance of, mm-hmm. you know, we are going through an aging curve, even if we're fighting it tooth and nail, and we're doing mm-hmm. all the right things. It's still happening. Sure. We just can do it on our terms. Well, that's a, that's the question. How long can you put that off? Like how long can you be as active as you can be so that you're not struggling to open a pickle jar when you're 60, 70 or 80 years old? I mean, foreseeably, as long as you manage your health and, and like you do, Alan, you move a lot, you eat well, you know, you could put th- that limitation off for quite some time, yeah. as long as you position your life to do so. So, but it, it it's still at some point, probably going to sure. come, you know, we were uh, yeah. talking to, um, I actually am working right now on getting uh, a woman on, she's 102 years old, or at least she, wow. she was when the book was written. And so I don't mm-hmm. know how old she's going to be when I interview her, but, mm-hmm. um, I'm like, yeah. And then, you know, I can sit there and joke about being over a hundred, but just recognizing that, yeah, things are probably gonna be a little different, uh, mm-hmm. when I'm a hundred and I might not be able to open a pickle jar, sure. but I'm going to be able to wipe my own ass. I can tell sure. you <laughs> <laughs> priorities. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> priorities. Yeah. You know? And so I think that's really, you know, this book is just about understanding yourself, particularly as a man, uh, cause mm-hmm. it was written by a man and it was, it was predominantly mm-hmm. written for men, uh, mm-hmm because women tend to open up a little bit easier to their friends about how they're feeling and what's going mm-hmm. on in their world. They're, they're much more likely to ask for help than a man is. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're much more likely to have people around them as a, as a social caring network, uh, mm-hmm. than men are. Um, mm-hmm. and we, men, we can fix that. We can, we can make some decisions for ourselves and say, okay, I, you know, I'm going to start building deeper relationships. I'm going to start, you know, sharing things uh, with my wife and with my friends that I, you know, before uh, wouldn't have shared Mm -hmm. uh, or wouldn't have said. And so I started this probably around uh, 15 years ago. So I, you know, I, I I tell people I, I was the fat bastard and the bastard part was a big part of it. It wasn't just the fat part. That was that too. Mm -hmm. But um, I decided that I would, I would tell my friends Every time I see them, that I love them. Oh, okay. That's, that's and for awesome. a man to tell another man, and like I love you, man, and not mm-hmm. just a, I'm drunk hugging you, I love you, man, kind of <laughs> sure. kind of thing, but just to really let them know that I I care deeply about you as a person, mm-hmm. and and so it's it's just you know it's kind of one of those things where when you start doing that, it just has this reverberation, this this resonance through your life that is is significant. And so Mm -hmm. I just want to encourage you to be thinking about the relationships that you have and be thinking about how 
the things around you that are good, how can we make that make more of those? How can we have more of those experiences and the things that are not serving you? How can mm -hmm. we move very, very far away from those things and just mm -hmm. not have them in our lives? Or if we have to have them in our lives, how can we just make them mean less? How sure. can we make them have less of an impact on us? And so this is a, this is a really good book for that. If you're just thinking, okay, I, I don't want to fade out. I, I want right. to actually have a really exciting second half of my life. Mm -hmm. And if that's in your head, then, and then this is, this is a good book for you. That sounds great. Sounds like a great book and a really neat uh, guy. Michael sounds like a neat person. Yeah, he is. <laughs> neat. <laughs> All right, good. Guys, I guess I'll talk to you next week. Okay. Great. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Jill Miller and discuss her book, Body by Breath, the science and practice of physical and emotional resilience. Until then, have a happy and healthy week.